for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him. But their thinking became fertile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they become fools. So there's, there's a progression there that, that starts with um, they, they knew God. And, and in our nation, that is uh, axiomatically true. We had a society that knew God. Can you clarify that, Pastor? Because I'm thinking when you know God, you're a Christian, you're a believer. Do you mean they know of God or they have access to him? Well, we're talking um, up at, um, uh, at verses 19 and 20, mm -hmm. which precede that. Um, and what's that say? Uh, I'm sorry, uh, 18 and 19. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So, so he says, first of all, well, go ahead and do 19 and then we'll talk about that. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown through it. To, to all of them. So they knew. So what is this this level of knowledge that Paul's talking about here? Well, he says in 19, since what they what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made it plain to them. They know there is a creator. But they go out of their way, as I was saying to this person today that I was talking to, I was saying, you know, I have defended uh, the book of Genesis for 50 years. In 1975, when I got saved, I immediately began to study apologetics. And I was out there defending against evolution and defending uh, against um, the ridiculousness of science falsely so-called. That's usually been the biggest attack on Genesis is evolution. Now we're to the place where the attack on Genesis is that God made them male and female. Never in my wildest dreams 50 years ago did I believe that we would have to defend the truth that God made them male and female. That is so self-evident that no one should have any difficulty with it. God has made these things about himself. And if you look at verse 20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. They know there's a God. They know that there's a God that made them. It is, you cannot study nature and, and come to the conclusion without great blindness that it was, that it happened by mistake. Our DNA, every single strand of it, how many 20 billion cells in our bodies, depending on how big you are. But something in the neighborhood of 20 billion, with a B, cells in our body. Every one of them have strands of DNA. Every single one of them. Those strands of DNA have more information encoded on them than every book in the Library of Congress added together. And there are 20 billion libraries of Congress just in our bodies. 
Now, would anybody here believe for one second that an accident happened at any level, anywhere in anything, and out of it exploded a fully formed Library of Congress? Is there anybody in order. who could who could scientifically argue for that happenstance? It took a trillion trillion years. No. I don't care how many years you had. Put monkeys at typewriters <laughs> and give them a trillion years, a trillion monkeys, a trillion years. Typing on typewriters, and they would never form all the books in the Library of Congress. Every one of our cells holds more information, coded, discreet, systematic information than the Library of Congress. You can't look at that and say it happened by accident. There are so many laws, they talk about, you know, life happening by accident. Do you know how many laws in the universe have to be exactly the way they are for life to even begin anywhere on any planet at any time, anywhere in the universe? And then to sustain it. There are two forces inside a nucleus. Smallest, the smallest particle of matter is an atom. Functional part. There are subatomic particles, and we're learning more about that. So that's kind of old, outdated in itself. But every single atom at the core of it, except hydrogen, every other atom in the, in the universe have two forces holding that atom together we have coined them the strong and the weak nuclear force. And that is the force that holds the protons together at the core of the atom. Even little tiny helium with only two protons need those forces to hold those atoms together. If those forces were slightly changed in either direction. If one of them was just a tiniest fraction stronger or weaker, or the other one, just a tiny fraction stronger or weaker, matter couldn't exist. They're protons, you're saying? The, the force that holds the protons together at the core of every nucleus other than hydrogen. Remember the periodic table? Yeah. What are the, what's the periodic table? What's it tell us? The different elements? Uh, how is an element defined? How is an element defined? Like gas and also how stable it is. By the number of protons in its nucleus. So hydrogen has one, helium has two, oxygen has six, uh, 16, I mean. Iron has, what's iron, 26, something like that. And they, the, the, Nucleus can be heavier or lighter because you can have more or less neutrons, but every particle of iron has the same number of protons. Every zinc, every other element in the periodic table, every one of that element has exactly that number of protons. That's what defines that element. That's what makes it what it is. And those elements have to be held together. Those protons have to be held together. Why? I mean, just from shooting off like this. Why do they have to be held together? To keep it balanced. Because they are all positives. Every proton is a positive charge. So they push away from each other. 
So what would happen if you put positive charges together? Put two positive magnets they together. They repel. So there are two forces that hold them together, the strong and the weak nuclear force. And that is the force that binds those protons together to form that element. And it's very hard to form elements. The only way that you can form elements heavier than hydrogen is in the core of a star. Or we're doing it today. We want to use it as a power source. How do you do it today? We have done it Split. in warfare. Fission. Fission. What's fission do? Nuclear fission, it separates. It divides. Split. What's the collider thing? That's one way of doing it. Nuclear, not fission, but fusion. You slam protons together at super high speeds, near the speed of light, and they bind together. The only place we can do it is in a bomb. Specifically, what bomb? Uh, nuclear. Not the atom bomb. Hydrogen. The hydrogen bomb. Oh, not the atomic bomb. Atomic bomb is fission. It divides uranium or plutonium. But, a, a, but the hydrogen bomb, yeah, because it fuses them together. What they do is, to build a hydrogen bomb, you take explosives, very high explosives, and you wrap them in a sphere around a sphere that has hydrogen in it. And they explode simultaneously, and the force of that explosion slams the hydrogen together with such force that it makes helium. It slams those nucleuses together and forms a heavier thing. I got a, so, I got about half of those steps, Tom. Can you go over the other half? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> My point is, all of that stuff has to work exactly as it does, or the universe can't exist. Now, let's talk about another part of outside of the protons. What do you have in every atom? Neutrons. Neutrons and what else? Electrons. Electrons. <clears throat> which are the negative charge. They form a cloud around the, the nucleus, the, the protons. They spin around them in a cloud. One for hydrogen, a bunch more for however big the atom is. If there is one, one less electron than proton out of, oh, it's like one, uh, 10 times 10 to the 170th power or something like that. That's a one with like 170 zeros after it. If the number of electrons doesn't match the number of protons to, a, to one out of this massive number, the whole universe flies apart. But it happened by random chance. No. So what Paul is saying here, and he didn't know any of this stuff. No one in his day did. Is, is these, we see such design order in the universe that anywhere you look, it's impossible to come away without saying there's a creator who is very, very smart and balance things to absolute perfection. And people know there's this God who is so far above us. And what do they do? They create gods in our image. They worship themselves instead of him.
And since they know this stuff, when they deny it, now we come to 21. Although they knew God, they knew this creator. They knew how powerful he was. They knew how perfect his knowledge was. Are you saying they knew it intrinsically, kind of? Uh, very much, but just look at the sky. You cannot go out on a clear night and look at the stars and go, yeah, this is all happenstance. There's something in the human psyche that when we see that, we know. Just like we know, what's the other fact we know? Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Verse 11, 320. 311. It's in our, it's in our, it's in our heart. Yeah, we know. If, if you find some bones that are, that are primatial, how do you know with absolute certainty, just without DNA or any of that stuff, you find ancient bones from how many thousands of years ago? How do you know with absolute certainty whether they're, they're some form of ape or humans? Animals don't bury their Burial dead. tradition. You'll find stuff buried with the humans. Tools. Tools. Sometimes jewelry. jewelry. Artifacts. Artifacts of Weapons. all kinds of times. Weapons. Weapons. Why? Why? Taking it into the next life. Those people didn't have a lot. How much was it a cost to their society thousands of years ago to bury a weapon or a tool with that person? Or a car. How much, how much of a drain on their society was that? Did they have weapons to throw away or tools to throw away? No, everything took yeah. work to build. Weapons or tools or any of that stuff. Pottery was a precious thing that they never had enough of, but they bury it with people because they knew there was an afterlife. They knew it with certainty. So much so that they were willing to sacrifice something they couldn't afford to give up. To send that person into that eternity. <clears throat> but we deny all that. And when we do, they knew God. They knew all these things about God. Remember years ago, the fellow that used to come to church, I forget who it was now, um, that, that it came out to a Christmas service or something and you were talking to him. And, uh, and he starts saying all this ridiculous stuff. And finally, what did he say to you? He, he said, he said, I can't believe what you're making me say. He knew the truth, but he was absolutely unwilling to acknowledge it. Well, then how did he know the truth? How could he know the truth and, and refuse to acknowledge it? You could ignore it. You can't he didn't want to be involved. He would not. You can know the truth. It's head knowledge, not heart knowledge. But, but... It's 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 knowledge, but you will not. You see it all the time. How how can that happen? You watch it on TV every day, and not to get political, but it's you know, um, ten million people have crossed the border illegally in the last ten in the last three years. Try to get a Democrat politician to acknowledge that. They know it's true, right? Will they say those words? No. 
You see, that's the thing. I know it's true, but I will not acknowledge it. I will not say those words. I will not admit it. I will say anything not to fess up to what I know is true. We know that there are men and there are women, and they are not the same. Remember a saying from about four years ago? What were they saying about four years ago? Follow the science. <laughs> Is it just the superficial physical characteristics that di differentiate men from women? At a fundamental level, women and men think differently. Are you all aware of that? Mm -hmm. Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why? Why is that true? They have different brain cells or? Our brains work differently between men and women. Your gatherers. Women. The two hemispheres, every human has two hemispheres, right and left, that control different functions. In men, the right and left hemispheres of the brain are far more divided. Men think on one side of the brain or the other, depending on what they're thinking about. Women, the two hemispheres work together and process together. Different. Do I'm always wrong. I was going to say one meant that you're always on the wrong side. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. They're burned apart. And and one of the great proofs of that is what happens when a man has a stroke. He loses. To, he he loses body. speech after a stroke if it's on the wrong, wrong side. Men almost never can speak. And getting that, that speech restored is very, very, very difficult. Men seldom fully recover from a loss of speech. Women either don't lose speech or they recover it very quickly. Why? Because both sections work together. Because both sides are working together in redundancy. Men, one side of the brain is controlling all the language. That side has a stroke. You lose the language. You just can't do it. So I just have to find a way to reprogram my brain so I can split it across both sides. <laughs> and and as men, doesn't work that way. Why do I men want to become girls? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, but but what that does is. What that does is it, it changes. Why have traditionally men gone into science and mathematics in far greater numbers than women? Because the way they think. Because of because the single focus of having one hemisphere or the other working independently gives itself to mathematic and science. It means thinking logically and sequentially is much easier for men. Why is it that traditionally women went into language studies and things like that? Because the fact that their brain functions different in communicating be, makes it much easier for them to do that. So you can't have it both ways. You can't. So both have strengths, both have weaknesses. God designed us to need each other. We're different. They won't even acknowledge that. And, and uh, I've had people say, well, pastor, why are you harping on this trans things? We don't have any trans people in our congregation. Because when, when you push lies out to this far, far extreme, You bring about a society that utterly reduces God from the entirety of their thinking.
And then what happens? They claim to be wise, but they become fools. fools. It's not that they were fools and therefore denied God. They denied God, and that very act made them into fools. But also opens the door up to a whole bunch of other stuff. Sure. That far. And, and we need to understand that that's where this battleground is, is going. And of course, is the target of this stuff us sitting here. No, it's the kids. Yeah. But isn't that a part of where the Bible says everybody's going to do what's right in their own eyes? Sure. Judges. But 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 remember, our job isn't to say, well, God says it's going to happen, so let's let it happen. What did Jesus say our job is? We're the salt and the light. The salt, the light, and we're to pray, thy will be done. Jesus said, Jerusalem's going to be destroyed. Did he say, so you people just, hey, party and let it be destroyed? Or, or did he tell them, go out in Jerusalem? Why preach in Jerusalem if it's going to be destroyed? Your house has left you desolate. Isn't that what Jesus said of Jerusalem? Then why did he say, you will... Uh, you will see power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. What? What's the rest of Acts 1 8? There 1 8, what? Acts 1 8. What's the rest of Acts 1 8? You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. About the earth. Jerusalem. Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Why? If God's going to judge it. Well, it's like Jonah. He was he supposed to go him. visit and have the people possibly repent and then he went and destroy it. Wicked Nineveh. What was wicked Nineveh's response? When Jonah showed up in Nineveh, what was his message? Repent. Be destroyed. Let's go to Jonah. God's going to destroy it. Yeah, the message was verse of uh, chapter three, verse four. Three more days and then it will be overturned. Did he give them any hope? No, not there. No, no. his message was you're done. 40 days, and you're destroyed. He didn't say, do good or in 40 days. He just said, you got 40 days, and you're dead. What was their response? Yeah, they said. They believed them. <laughs> look at verse 9. Jonah 3. Look at verse 9. Jonah didn't say this. They said this. What did they say? You can tell if God will turn. You can tell if God will turn. Relent. And turn away from his, his fierce anger so that we may not turn. They said, there's a shot. That's Maybe good. if we turn and relent, God will have compassion on us. He feared God. Does it, does it say, they said, well, God will have to forgive us if we. Yeah. No, they, took they didn't have any promise. They took a chance. They just said, maybe. So even though God has said, had said, I'm going to destroy you. They said, let's put it off a while. Maybe if we 
if we do the right thing now, God will be willing to forgive us, maybe. And, and sometimes it, it, we'll take scripture where God says what he's going to do at some point. And we see things moving that way. And instead of saying, okay, it's going to go that way sometime. But does it have to be today? Do our children have to be the one that suffer with it? Can we maybe put it off? Worked for them. How many people that were there to repent, even the tiniest baby, was around when God came back to destroy them? A hundred and fifty years. So how many of them were there? None of, none of them. Not the youngest baby. Probably none of their children or even their grandchildren were there. They protected not just themselves, but their children and their grandchildren by doing that. You know, it's kind of funny you said that Jonah didn't say it. He not only didn't say it, he would have seen it dying. Yeah. Seen it. Yeah. Gosh. Yeah, <laughs> he said that with a smile on his face. Yeah, oh, yeah. Did he, he hated them because they were an evil people, right? Like they hurt the Jewish people. Well, I don't think he hated them because they were an evil people. He hated them because they were the ruling group, a threat. They threatened Israel. They were the, you know, were, were the Soviet people. In the 1970s, when I was coming of age, were they an evil people? People? Russia. I mean, they Russia. Are, yeah. Are you talking about the general population? Were, the, were they an evil people? No, they, they were on the Russian people. side, so yes. Even though. And, 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 uh, and I think Ron's right. I think mo most of them hated what was going on, but they were powerless to change it. Were they an evil, were they an evil system? Yes. 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 It's just like Iran today. Yeah. People are hating their government. Correct, but they're powerless. So I don't know that, that, that the people of Nineveh were entirely evil from that standpoint any more than anyone else was. But they were part of an evil system. People judge them by the overall. And, and, and you can see in America how easy it is for a country to become an evil system. We're facing that today. We have gone from a country that stood from for to, to one that, that's becoming more and more. If, if, you, if you go back, let's but even look at present time. The good people can't even have any power against the evilness. Yep, exactly. In place. Yeah. If you go back 60 years, 19, 70 years, 1950s, what impact did America have on the culture of the world? In what year? What year? So say the 1960s, 50s, early. 60s. So leave it to Beaver years. So leave it to Beaver. <laughs> but what kind of movies were being put out? Good Good Cecil B. DeMille's Bible stuff. Bible stuff. Ben Hur. Ben Hur. The Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. Yeah. Were they were they biblically accurate? No. no. Not. 50 50. Yeah, they were Hollywoodized. But what are we putting out today? Garbage. Quite the opposite. People who who watched the entertainment that America broadcast into the world, were they uplifted or denigrated okay. by it? For the most part, uplifted. Yeah. Are people uplifted by what we're producing today? No way. Why? Why? Why do you think that is? 
Why? Explain because and laugh at us. Even, even the and, super and, hero movies, where you think you're going to go and see, yeah, and it's uh, even the opposite there. Yeah, these are all kids making these movies today. Yeah, you know, our generation. Yeah, remember, remember uh, Superman, Truth, Justice, and the American Way. Yep, the new Superman. It's not the American Way. It's, oh it's no! Yeah, so the, a lot of these things are rewritten now and changed. Yep. Garbage. Well, I think what, what's happened is we've gotten away from God little by little. Yeah, yeah. See, that's exactly what yeah. these things. But but our response to that can be, well, the Bible says that's going to happen. And, and that's very easy to do. How many generations of Christians had believed that, that that's what God said, said would happen, and here it is, it's upon us. How long ago, how far back can this belief that, you know, this is it, how far back can you trace that in, in a, a predominance of the church? I'd say at least 500 years. The, the, the strongest Christian leaders 500 years ago, who are we talking about? Luther, Calvin, some of those guys, they were all saying, this is the end. The Pope is the Antichrist. Martin Luther had a saying, the Pope is the Antichrist. And, and Tetzel is the false prophet. Who was Tetzel? Anybody know? He's the guy that was selling the indulgences. Oh, purgatory. So, what would have happened if Martin Luther would have thrown up his hands and say it's the end of time? That Jesus said it was going to happen. Here we are. Ready to give up. Would any of us be here today? No. Probably not. No. Well, at that rate, we're no better than Jonah. We just want to, to you know, everything just burn. Yeah. So that's why that's why we have to recognize what it is without giving into it has to be that way. Maybe God will relent. Maybe if we get serious in our repentance, God will relent. Could that happen? Yes. yes. Happen for them. You think our Christianity compared to the Christianity of old is, is a lot more, I mean, uh, like the, Christi the Christianity so many hundred years ago was more serious where stuff that we call Christianity now, the secret friendly church is really not Christianity. Yeah. They, they might preach the gospel. The morals are different. Yeah. Hope well, different. and again, and this is where, this is where I really have a problem. We have defined what does it mean to preach the gospel? Read the Bible. Teach them to repent and, and believe. Yeah, but that's not what's being preached at all. So we, we're we very quick. What generally we have said is anybody who says you have to believe in Jesus is preaching the Bible. Uh, and that's I not the biblical gospel. So, so even when we say, well, we're preaching the gospel, is it the biblical gospel or is it the other gospel that Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians 11? Watered down. Right, by their definition, Satan would be a Christian. Yeah. We're not preaching the hell, fire, and damnation that they used to preach. Do we all understand the pendulum principle? Swing one way and then comes back the other way. And the further it goes in one direction. What are what are the what are the two ends? of the pendulum when it comes to the heresies about salvation. What are the two ends of the pendulum? Isn't it great? There, love and judgment. That there is no God. Law. Oh. You're saved by legalism. Oh, and love. Grace. The other side is? Grace. Grace that is turned into? License. A license for immorality. When you are on the law side of the pendulum, when the pendulum's over here, what do you need to preach? Grace. Grace. So when you, the law, we're way over here, and that's where the pendulum was 500 years ago, right? 
Mm -hmm. Guys like Luther and Calvin and all these other guys, Wingley, all these other guys started preaching grace. So what was the cry of the Reformation? Legal. Salvation is through Christ alone, through faith alone, sure. by grace alone, taught by the scriptures alone. Fourfold thing. Christ alone, grace alone, faith alone, uh, the scriptures alone. And they preach grace. And the pendulum began to swing, 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 and preach grace, 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 grace. And then it hit down here. And what happened? Kept preaching grace, 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 grace. By the time it gets up here, who's pushing for the church to preach grace? When it's out here, who's push, pushing for the church to preach grace? The Holy Spirit. By the time it gets over here, who's pushing for the church to preach grace? Oh, he's preaching grace, right? Yeah. Who's pushing them now to preach grace? Oh, Satan. Because he knows that you're going to go way off the rails in the license for immorality. So on the law side or the, or the grace, on the grace side. Grace so at some point in the last couple hundred years, we should have started preaching law, 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 law. So you're saying when it's when it's when we're supposed to be preaching grace, it Satan is law. wanting everyone to preach law. Right. Need a balance, is what you're saying. Yeah. So Doesn't this go back to pushing, your analogy? In, in 500 years ago in the Catholic Church, who was inspiring them to preach law, 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 law? Who was inspiring guys like Tetzel and, and the Pope to preach law, 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 law? Same. Satan. Same. Perfectly obvious to us. But when you get over here, it's not obvious to anybody, it seems today, that the same Satan is pushing us to go to this far extreme of grace. So we can say we're preaching the gospel because we're preaching what what um, what the church was preaching 500 years ago in the Reformation, but we're doing it to different people. And who you're preaching to, uh, Jeremiah 23. Verses 16 and 17. Ah, oh, we can start at 15. I want 16 and 17, but we can start 16. Therefore, this is 2315. This is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. I will make them drink. Uh, eat bitter food and drink poisoned water because from the prophets of Jerusalem, ungodliness has spread throughout the land. The very prophets are the ones spreading ungodliness. Talking false prophets. Well, yes. They became false but they're, But they're not prophets of Baal. They're prophets claiming to speak for God. Maybe. They're prophets of Yahweh. Well, everybody claims to. You never drive down. What's the one sign you'll never see out in front of a church? Church of Satan. No. The first church of heretics. Hmm. Nobody admits to be to being a heretic. Everybody claims they're representing God. Except the ones that are worshiping Satan and they re represent that they're doing that properly. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hope. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. 
Notice they're, they claim they're representing, this isn't the prophets of Moloch, the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah. These aren't the guys that, that Elijah was dealing with 150 years earlier that were speaking in the name of some false god. These guys are speaking in the true God's name. Right? They, um, they keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you will have peace. They're kind of like the Joel Osteen's. They are exactly not just the Joel Osteen's, but so much of the evangelical church today. God loves us all. I had a conversation with a woman who claims to be a Christian. He's, she's part of my, re, my writing group. She wrote a, a Christian book, and, and I, I, I said uh, in that Christian book, uh, because she makes a statement, and, and I said, if you're going to market this in the mass market, I don't have a problem with that. If you're claiming this is a Christian book, I've got some problems with this, because I'm going to critique it not just as a, a critiquer, but also as a Christian. You say, you're saying God loves she has this angelic being that, you know, it was sort of like a touched by, by an angel kind of book. And this angel's going, you know, God loves everybody. And I go, wait a minute. Whoa. Is that true? Does God love everybody? Oh. Well, and by what standard does God love everybody? And her response was, well, for God so loved the world. Yes. But are there people that God says he hates? Who does God hate? Children of Satan. People who refuse to repent. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says you'll have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say no, no harm will come to you. But which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word? Who has listened and heard his word? See, the storm of the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes the purposes of his heart. In the days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets. Yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, hmm. if they were preaching the gospel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and their evil deeds. <laughs> they would have preached in one word, repent. But they preached every other message than that, but because they were quoting the Bible, are there verses that say you will have peace? Are there verses in the Bible that say you will have peace? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are there verses uh, in the Bible uh, that, that, that say no harm will come to you? One that people love to quote, which is? I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Yeah. But who gets to have that message preached to them? Is people who are repentant. Not people who are despising God and following their own stubborn ways. They don't get that message. The message they need to get is God's got a great big hammer and he's not afraid to use it. And if you think you can survive the hammer when God swings it, lots of luck, idiot, because you're going to be crushed. And that's the message God says, if you were listening to me with this group of people, that's what you'd preach. How many people in America have a repentant spirit today? Not many at all. How many people in America today have a, 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 a rebellious spirit that they'll follow their own ways? They don't think of it. Anymore. But
but or stubborn spirit. Let's use that word. That they're going to do what they want to do. And the message to them needs to be not peace. Needs to be God's going to judge you with a wampum stick. And when he gets done, you'll wish you'd never been born. Does, does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Can you, uh, can you maybe uh, next time or when you get a chance, teach on this more? Because, you know, uh, so many times people say, for God loves you, God loves you. And, and, and he does. And I was always taught, like in John 3, 16, when it says, for God so loves the world. He loves the world in the sense that he sent his son to die for the world. But he loves the Christian in a different way. It's called efficaciously, you know, an effective way. But I think about what you say more about, I, I, I think people do need to hear what you, they don't need to hear that God loves them until they hear the bad news. And then, yep. like, you need to hear, you need to hear the illness that you have before you need the cure. Yep. Like, the cure is God, oh, I'm scared now. Well, wait a minute. What, God does love, you know what I mean? What was, what was Peter's message on the day of Pentecost? First Christian sermon ever preached. What was his message? God loves you. What was his message? God loves you and has a wonderful plan. And has a wonderful plan for your life. Yeah. Is that what Peter preached? Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 and uh, the verse. Um, yeah. Um, verse 36. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified. You crucified! They lived in the Roman Empire. What would have happened if they'd have gotten their hands on a Roman emperor and crucified a Roman emperor? If the Jews did? Yes. They'd have been killed right away. Would there be a Jew alive on earth no. today? No, they would have wiped them out. They would, Rome would have hunted them to absolute extinction. And Peter's message to them is, you didn't crucify a Roman emperor. You crucified the Son of God. You did it. You are more. What's his implication about how God feels about them right now? Is he saying God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life? Or is he saying God is so angry at you, it's a wonder you're taking another breath? You better be thankful that you've got three more breaths because I don't know if you're going to live out this minute. God is so angry at you, don't assume you have any chances left. Does he give them, like Jonah, does he give them, so therefore you need to do, does he give them any hope? 40 days and you're done. What did, did Peter give them any hope? Not here. When the people heard this, they were cut to the, he stops his sermon right there. You killed God. He's dead. And he walks off the stage. And what does the people do? What must we do? <gasps> Wait, what? Come back. Tell us what can we do about this? Then he gives them hope. Repent. Like you say, the law, and then. Yep. But he didn't tell them that. He didn't, that wasn't part of his sermon. They had to call him back to get that message. He ended with, you're done. God's going to pound on you so hard. Same message as Jonah. And you can see Peter kind of walking off and, and building his little tabernacle outside Jerusalem and going, okay, God. 
But the people called him back and said, wait, 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 wait. What do we do about this? I remember my father-in-law saying all the people that Billy Graham reached in these crusades, our country should be a different way. Huh? But it's not because there was a lot of, I don't want to say false conversions, but it was I like, would. like, yeah. But like you said, it, was ex it wasn't explained right. So, I mean, it, it, I don't want to blame the people so much. They, they just heard and they came to what they heard. But the person telling it didn't say, he, he didn't teach it the right way. So we had a group of kids sitting behind us at a Greg Laurie crusade. Remember that, Mabel? Yeah. And they're, they're laughing and teeheeing and mocking through the whole sermon. At the end of it, I turned around and I said, you people need to go down there. Oh, we don't need to do that. We got saved two years ago at one of these. <laughs> and I said, there's not a prayer in hell that you're saved. Oh, no. He, he hated it. Well, How dare you? And I said, because you're unconverted. There's no way you can laugh through that, what he was preaching tonight. And and be a Christian. I mean, you said the right thing, I think. Oh, yeah. Uh, so do I. And better that you said it because maybe one of them out of the whole group might have said, boy, that, that guy but, be right. But there were the, their leaders were. Here's these people following the stubbornness of their heart. They couldn't sit there and, and zero in on the word of God for one minute. And, they're, and and when I got done preaching to them about how you need to repent and turn from sin or you're not a Christian, they said, well, nobody's ever said this to us. <laughs> no, they haven't, because they preached a false gospel. Hey, God bless. Yeah. Have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Bob. Good night, all. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.